Thank you again for joining us for another COVID vaccine update. Uh, I'm here along with Scott Peterson. Um, I'll begin by looking at the technology. So what you have on the screen there is a, um, the virus, a picture of the virus, as you can see. Um, it's a schematic representation. The virus is a sphere with spikes. The red spikes you see in the illustration are how this virus attaches to the human cell. And that's how it makes uh, entry into the cell and then causes infection, um, multiplies within the cell, and as a result causes COVID-19 disease. Um, as we know, that's um, very devastating to um, people when uh, it takes a severe form. What you also see in that picture is uh, the genetic material inside that sphere is a spiral that's called the RNA and that's the genetic makeup of this virus and that's how this virus can multiply. That's also how it makes its proteins. And if you look at that spiral, there's a portion that is colored red. That's the uh, part of the gene for the virus that makes spike protein. And that spike protein is uh, how those projections, you see the spikes, that's how it gets its name, the corona, because it looks like a crown or a solar corona eclipse, and that's also how it causes disease. So we'll, we'll see in the next few slides how that spike protein is the key target for vaccine makers and um, how the vaccine was developed. So um, here you have a, a table showing the um, two RNA vaccines in the middle, uh, Moderna and the Pfizer-BioNTech. Uh, both of these vaccines are currently uh, given emergency use authorization by the Food and Drug Administration. So the FDA has given emergency use for these two um, based on uh, very vigorous uh, phase three human trials that showed these vaccines are extremely safe and also extremely effective, up to 95% protection against the disease. Both of these vaccines require two doses, and you can see there's a difference in uh, the storage requirements. The Moderna requires minus 20 degrees Celsius, or it's um, similar to freezer temperatures. The Pfizer-BioNTech requires uh, ultra-cold storage, Arctic temperatures, min minus 70 degrees Celsius. Just to compare the other two vaccines there, the one on top, the United Kingdom, uh, gave emergency use authorization to Oxford University AstraZeneca vaccine and that is a viral vector vaccine and similar to the Russian vaccine that also received uh, authorization in Russia, it's called the Gamalaya Sputnik V. These two are viral vector vaccines, so they actually have a um, non-threatening virus that's used as a vehicle, that's why it's called a vector. And the key there is the RNA technology does not use any virus particles, does not use any virus or parts of the virus at all, it's all synthetic. And in that sense, um, the RNA vaccines are different from the traditional viral vector vaccines. And you can see both the Oxford and the Russian vaccines also require two doses, but their storage requirements are just regular fridge temperatures. So let's take a look at how this vaccine works. If you uh, look on the left hand of that image, left side of the image, um, you can see a spiral. That's the messenger RNA. It's called messenger because it carries a code for a specific protein, and, and that is the spike protein. So when you uh, get this injection, you can see in that first human figure on the left, uh, all that the injection carries is this messenger RNA inside a fat droplet. Uh, think of it as a greasy little droplet. Now these are very tiny droplets. They're nanometer size, so size, so 10 to the power of minus nine. So to give you an idea, unless you have an electron microscope, you won't see this RNA or that oil droplet or the fat droplet that carries it. The fat droplet is what keeps this RNA from disintegrating because this messenger RNA is extremely delicate. And that's why you need those storage temperatures to be really cold. But the good news is the composition of this vaccine is not very complicated. There are no preservatives, there are no latex or eggs or cells or fetal cells or anything, just simply the messenger RNA inside a fat droplet. So these are really, really tiny, again, electron microscope size. So once injected, the messenger RNA then uh, enters the cell. Once it enters the cell, the cell naturally uh, decodes the messenger RNA. That's how all proteins are made in life. Uh, every uh, plant and animal on the planet makes 
proteins using messenger RNA. So this is not uh, unusual. So as soon as the messenger RNA gets into the cell, it's um, decoded, and then this protein is made. This, you can see there the gold spike protein on the right hand, right hand image. And once that protein is made, the human immune system kicks in. It recognizes that this is not uh, normal and immediately forms antibodies. This red Y-shaped um, picture in the picture there. Those things are specifically targeted against the spike protein. So once they're made, this person is uh, ready after vaccination, fully humanized and protected. So in real life, uh, this person, when they come into contact with the coronavirus, uh, the virus is unable to attach to the cells because the moment the virus enters the body, uh, the body's antibodies, these red antibodies, glom on to the spike part of that uh, protein of the virus. You saw that in the previous picture, the spherical virus. And once these antibodies attach to the spike protein, the virus cannot uh, infect a cell, attach to a cell, and to the cell. So in a, in a very simple way, this vaccine creates targeted immunity or targeted protection, and they call this neutralizing the virus. That's what these antibodies are called. They're called neutralizing antibodies. The good news also is this messenger RNA does not enter the nucleus of the cell. So inside the cell, there's our genetic material, which is called DNA, and most of you know that. So the DNA is protected by a nucleus, and the messenger RNA never enters the nucleus. It just cannot, and there's never a time this vaccine, the mRNA, never a time when it comes into contact with our genetic material. So our DNA is safe, and the RNA, once it's translated and decoded into this protein, it actually disintegrates or completely vanishes from the cell in about a day or two. And that's just the nature of messenger RNA. And so in, in a lot of ways, it's a very uh, reason why it's such a safe vaccine. Let's take a quick look at vaccine development. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, no shortcuts cuts were done during the uh, approval of this vaccine, uh, both the vaccines. Um, it takes a long time for a vaccine to develop, mainly because number one, funding. Here we had the um, Operation Warp Speed provide lots of funding. Uh, number two, also there was a real race uh, to save uh, the human uh, you know, life from this disease. And a lot of these things were done simultaneously, lots of meetings, lots of data sharing. So you can see if you start from the left side of this image, um, they need to have first a preclinical research where they look at the uh, virus and decide what kind of target they need to attack. And fortunately for us, because of modern advances in genetic technology, as soon as the virus was first isolated in the first two weeks of January of last year, they published it, uh, made it openly available, and then researchers immediately uh, copied that genetic sequence of the virus and immediately targeted that specific gene you saw, the, that spike protein gene. And they were immediately able to come up with a candidate vaccine. This is the hardest part because it takes many years to get to that part. So this one they got very quickly, actually in a couple of weeks. Uh, once done, then they did animal studies um, to make sure it's safe and it successfully passed that. Then they moved to all the human trials and they are divided into phases. So phase one human trial, less than 100 volunteers, and they look for safety. And they were successful there, very safe. And then they went to phase two, where they have a little over 100 volunteers. And this time they're looking not just at safety, they wanna look at efficiency, is it really protective? And then what's the dosage needed um, to protect and then finally, the most important phase three, which is a large trials, we're talking about tens of thousands of volunteers. In fact, between the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, there are a total of 75,000 volunteers that were um, in the trial. So there's a large group of people that they could get enough safety data, enough efficiency data, and also what the dosage should be. So this, phase three trial is what led the FDA to confidently say, this is a safe vaccine, this is an effective vaccine, and it should be given out to the public. So no, no point did this uh, whole sequence of events get uh, uh, you know, bypassed. All of them were done very quickly, some of them simultaneously, and that's why we got these two approvals um, that are really uh, amazing in modern science. 
And finally, we'll talk a little bit about phase four, which is after the vaccine is licensed, then they continue to um, look at some other groups that they couldn't include in the trials. We'll talk about that later. So let's look at the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. Uh, it's called Comirnaty or Um That's the pharmaceutical term for this vaccine. So let's look at the data from the phase three trial. Um, for the Pfizer-BioNTech, they had 44,000 human uh, participants in the trials, uh, and then they were distributed across um, USA, Argentina, Brazil, Germany, South Africa, and Turkey, but 77% or so were actually in the United States, the trial participants. So the breakup of the groups that were enrolled, half were male, half female, and you, you can see also the other groups that were very important uh, in order to make sure that the results are valid in the real world. 82% were white people. 10% African-American people, 4.4% Asian people, and less than 3% from other racial groups. 26% or uh, roughly one in four were Hispanic or Latino, Latina. And then 21% of participants, uh, in other words, one out of five were greater than 65 years of age. And the median age was 51 years old, which means that half of this 44,000 group were younger than 51, half were older than 51. And the cutoff age, lower cutoff, was 16 years in this trial. Um, for the Moderna trial, it was 18 years. So the important here is they only looked from 16 to 18 years all the way up to end of life, but did not look at pediatric populations. So what were the most common adverse reactions? Injection side reactions, um, 84%. So that's common, a little swelling, a little pain at the site of the injection. That's very commonly seen with pretty much any muscular injection that you give in the muscle. The other symptoms are expected symptoms, fatigue, headache, muscle pain, chills, joint pain, fevers. These are um, distressing to the person undergoing them, um, but the good news is that's what we expect from vaccines that provoke the immune system to generate antibodies. And it means the vaccine is working. It also means that unfortunately for those that do experience these symptoms, it's usually a small minority, about 10% of recipients have these kind of symptoms. Um, it lasts a day, sometimes two, um, and the worst day is the first day, and then gradually it gets better. Usually within a week, it's completely gone. Uh, these symptoms are not permanent, number one. Number two, they do not require any medical intervention. They don't need hospitalization. They don't need any medication, just over the counter if needed. Uh, and most folks, um, you know, when they report it, are really distressed. It's, it's not a very pleasant thing. Um, but the good news is these are what are called acceptable risks because the benefits of this vaccine are tremendous. This vaccine uh, protects you from getting COVID-19, which is a deadly disease, causes death. But additionally, in those that uh, don't die, unfortunately, it also has both short-term and long-term consequences. And COVID-19 is an unusual disease and it affects pretty much every organ in the body. It starts in the lung, but it affects the brain, the heart, kidney, liver, and blood vessels, causes blood clots um, in blood vessels um, everywhere. So, and then there's the long form of COVID, which is a chronic condition that folks, unfortunately, some of them continue to experience for many months after they re recovered from the illness. So the one point we will focus on in the next slide is severe adverse reactions, and they accounted for a very small, really fraction, 0.5% of the folks. So let's look at the most common um, severe adverse events. So those who received the vaccine, a very minority of them, appendicitis 0.04%, heart attack 0.02%, and stroke 0.02%. So in the placebo arm, this is the, they divide this 44,000 people into two groups. Half of them get the vaccine, half don't. And that's how these studies are done, because then you have a case group and a control group. So in the placebo group, these folks didn't receive the vaccine, they just received a saline injection in the arm, a salt water injection in the arm. These folks also reported some uh, severe adverse events. So uh, pneumonia, 0.03%, atrial fibrillation, 0.02%, and syncope, 0.02%. Syncope is fainting, atrial fibrillation is a type of heart rhythm uh, problem. Uh, again, these were in the group that did not get the vaccine. So of the total uh, number of appendicitis cases in both groups, 
uh, it was 12. Eight were in the vaccine group and four were in the uh, group that received the saline injection. So of the eight in the vaccine group, six were in the younger age group, as you would expect, between 16 to 55 years of age. And then two occurred in the older age group, uh, greater than 55 years of age. And then one of them had perforation. These are complications of appendicitis, one had an abscess. So all of these cases of appendicitis um, is what you would expect in the general population at the rates and frequencies that were reported in these groups. So none of these cases, not the appendicitis or the stroke or the heart attack or the syncope or atrial fibrillation were related to either the vaccine or the salt water injection. These were what you would expect in the general population. There was no link between vaccine and these severe adverse events. Looking at deaths, a um, total of six occurred. Two were reported in the vaccine group and four in the placebo group, the group that did not get the vaccine that got the salt water injection in the arm. In the vaccine group, uh, one participant had obesity and atherosclerosis, which is a disease of the blood vessels, and these were pre-existing conditions, and that person died three days after dose one. The other um, experienced a cardiac arrest 60 days after dose two, died three days later. And then the four deaths that occurred in the placebo arm, the ones that did not receive the vaccine, there were four deaths. Um, two of them unknown cause, one died of stroke, one of heart attack, and three of these deaths occurred in the older age group, as you would expect, greater than 55 years of age. Once again, the important thing is all these deaths, uh, there's no connection to the vaccine itself. These are what you would expect to occur in the general population in the rates uh, and at those age groups that you would um, see in this um, population. Let's take a look at this graph. It kind of is, uh, illustrates how effective this vaccine is. So if you look at the bottom, there are two green arrows. Those are pointing the days when they received the vaccine. So um, the blue line represents those that received vaccine. The red line is all those people in the trial, 22,000, that did not receive the vaccine. So the green arrow you can see on day one, they, get, they got this Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, and the blue line people. And then on day 22, which is three weeks later, they got the second dose. So you can see initially both the red and blue lines are together, but past day 10 or 12, they separate. And the reason is there are no more occurrence or incidence of COVID-19 disease in the blue arm. There are no more new, new participants with disease. While those in the red arm that did not get, you can see the red line, they did not get the vaccine, they continue to have uh, increasing numbers of COVID-19 disease uh, in that population because they were not protected. So the saline injection did not protect them. But the vaccine arm, you can see after day 10 and on through day 22 after the second dose, and there were no more incidences of disease. So this is a very good uh, illustration of how uh, powerful the effect of the vaccine is. The two doses completely protect that group. So in uh, final uh, results, 95% of all participants were protected. In other words, if you had 100 people in a room and you gave them all this Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, 95 people were completely protected, never got any COVID disease. And the five people who got the disease, the good news is they got a very mild form of COVID-19 with almost no symptoms and they recovered without any long-lasting effects on their well-being. So what it goes to show is this vaccine is 100% protective when it comes to preventing severe disease and 95% protective when it comes to stopping all forms of mild, moderate, or severe COVID-19 disease. The other important takeaway here is in the age group greater than 55 years of age, those folks benefited tremendously, 93.7% protection. So this is the vulnerable population. As you know, their immune system is not as robust as the younger group. And also the fact is in the US, of all the deaths that have occurred to date uh, from COVID-19, 85% of deaths have occurred in the age group greater than 65 years or older. So this is a very important um, you know, take away from how good this vaccine is in protecting those uh, older than 55. 
just a world map uh, looking at all the countries um, that independently reviewed the safety data, the effic efficacy data of this Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and gave approval. Pretty much all of North America, Canada, United States, Mexico, and then you have a lot of countries in South America, Argentina, Chile, Ecuador, and you can see on the uh, Western Europe, all 27 U European Union nations have approved it. Uh, so is Switzerland and the uh, United Kingdom all of the Middle Eastern countries, and then uh, in Asia, the Singapore. So again, a very broad consensus scientists, researchers, experts in this field, are agreeing uh, that this is a worthwhile, safe vaccine that's going to protect humanity. So let's now look at uh, Moderna's vaccine, mRNA-1273. So they also uh, went through all of the trials, preclinical trials, animal trials, safety trials, phase one, phase two, uh, phase three human trials. And again, uh, no shortcuts. They had to also submit their two months worth of data to the FDA. Uh, one thing I would point out, both these trials are still ongoing, both the Pfizer-BioNTech trial and the uh, uh, Moderna trials. These are two year long trials. Uh, the FDA required any vaccine uh, that sub, uh, maker that wants approval to submit at least two months of data. And the reason two months is most vaccines that we've uh, noticed uh, since we've been uh, making mac vaccines from the 50s, two months about all the time you need to catch 99.9% .9 of any adverse uh, effects, short or long term. Usually then the two years is to complete and discover if there's anything rare that's lurking. But at this point, the evidence strongly points to a safe, effective, more importantly, protective uh, vaccine. So in this um, Mod Moderna trial, they enrolled 30,000 uh, people. Half uh, were given placebo or saline injection, half were given uh, 100 microgram intramuscular injections on day one and day 29, so four weeks apart. So let's look at um, the groups that were in the trial. Half were male, half female. 36.5% per per of participants were communities of color. 10% were African American, 5% Asian people, and less than 3% from other racial groups. 20% of participants were Hispanic or Latino, Latina. And that's again, good number, so one in five were Hispanic. 25% of individuals, one in four, were greater than 65 years of age. This is, again, very impressive, um, taking these very vulnerable groups and making sure that they are part of the trial so that when the results come, we can confidently say that we can generalize this to the real world. Adverse reactions, very similar to the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. You can see injection site pain 92% of the time. And then the others that we commonly expect in these kind of immunogenic vaccines that provoke an immune response from the human body, you have fatigue, 68%, headache, 63%, muscle pain, 60%, joint pain, 45%, and, and chills, about 44%. So these are not uncommon. In fact, they are expected. So the good news is these expected reactions, uh, I know it's very distressing, unpleasant, uh, causes displeasure and suffering for those undergoing it. And it's a minority of folks, 10% of people who receive vaccine that undergo this. Uh, but they benefit from the um, tremendous protection that this vaccine provides, 95% protection against the dreaded COVID-19 disease. So if you are thinking about these things, remember that, um, yes, these are um, something you uh, don't want to experience. Uh, but if you were unfortunate enough to experience it, remember that it, the, by getting these doses, two doses, you're protecting yourself from COVID-19 uh, and its short and long-term bad effects. And then we'll focus on the severe adverse reactions again. Um, they occurred in about 0.2%. So what were the severe adverse events? In, um, you can see in the vaccine group, uh, heart attack, five cases versus only three cases in the placebo group, the, which is the group that got no vaccine, but just got a saline uh, injection in the arm. Cholecystitis, which is a gallbladder inflammation, three cases in the vaccine group, no cases in the placebo group. Nephrolithiasis, which is a kidney stone, and three cases in the vaccine group and zero cases in the placebo group. A small number of cases, you can see these are all tiny, tiny numbers. Um, and the same with uh, the placebo group, the group that just received a saltwater injection, they also suffered some severe adverse events. 
pneumonia in 0.05% and a pulmonary embolism, which is a blood clot in the lung, 0.03%. These kind of small numbers are not because of the vaccine. These are what you would expect in the general population to occur at the rates they occurred in this group of individuals in those age groups. Again, these are just incidental findings, not causally related or linked to the vaccine itself. And as far as deaths, there were 13 deaths. Um, six were in the vaccine group and seven in the placebo group. And two of those deaths were in, uh, greater than 75 years age with pre-existing heart disease. And one participant died of cardiopulmonary arrest, 21 days after dose one, and uh, one of them died of heart attack, 45 days after dose two. And then there was a 70-year-old with cardiac disease uh, found dead 57 days after dose two. A 56-year-old with uh, high blood pressure, chronic back pain, being treated with opioid narcotic pain medication died 37 days after dose one, and the cause of death was listed as head trauma. And there was a 72-year-old vaccine recipient with Crohn's disease, underlying Crohn's disease and short bowel syndrome, who unfortunately succumbed to uh, complications from it, uh, died 40 days after dose two. And then one vaccine recipient died of suicide 21 days after dose one. In the group that did not get the vaccine, the placebo group, those that received the saline injection in the arm, um, three died of a heart attack, one died of intra-abdominal perforation, one died of uh, cancer with some um, you know, complications from that, and one died of COVID-19 disease. And in one case, the cause was unknown. Once again, none of these deaths, um, these were all reviewed independently by a safety review board. None of them uh, were linked to the vaccine itself. These are kind of events you would expect in the general population in the rates in those age groups. Let's look at the incidence curves for the mRNA 1273 Moderna vaccine. This is very similar story to the uh, Pfizer-BioNTech one. Uh, here the red line represents those that got the vaccine, the blue line, represents those that did not get the vaccine, they just got the placebo or the saline injection in the arm. And again, the two green arrows, um, the first one is day one and the second one is day 29. So they're four weeks apart, the two doses. So you can clearly see after the second dose, no more uh, on the red line, no more incidences or occurrence of the disease. But you can see in the blue line after day 12, they, they continue to have uh, COVID-19 disease. Um, Unlike the red arm, which was protected by the vaccine, the blue line just got the saline injection. Again, clearly demonstrating that the two doses of the Moderna vaccine protect you from the disease. Well, the saline injection clearly, you know, unfortunately for these folks, they continue to experience uh, COVID-19 disease. So in summary, the Moderna vaccine is equally effective at 94.5% against, um, you know, for all participants. And what's more impressive is those older than 65, 100% uh, effective in um, preventing uh, the disease. So these folks uh, that get this vaccine never get uh, severe disease and 95% uh, of them never get any type of disease. So it's a very strong uh, result for a very effective vaccine against COVID-19. Let's look at DART uh, findings. These kind of these results are helpful to understand if it is safe uh, for pregnancy, for reproduction, for uh, development of the embryo or the development of children. So these trials, they're called developmental and uh, reproductive toxicity trials, and they cannot be done in humans for ethical reasons. So they're always done in animal models, in this case, female rats. So the Moderna vaccine was given at the same dose, 100 micrograms and two doses and they studied them and there was no um, effect on uh, reproduction, on uh, fetal development, embryo development, or development after delivery. So uh, clearly a strong uh, indication of how safe this vaccine is, at least in animal models. And uh, usually if that, if that is the case, uh, it applies uh, extrapolating to humans as well. But uh, like I said, these trials can't be done on pregnant women for ethical reasons. So let's look at the world map for Moderna. Again, very good. Canada, United States, uh, European Union, and the United Kingdom and Israel. So a lot of, and um, you know, again, these are independent uh, researchers, global experts in the field who um, are validating the safety and efficiency of this vaccine. So let's look at some um, frequently asked questions. 
So the vaccine is okay if you're pregnant or if you're breastfeeding. Uh, important thing is it's a shared decision making between you and the pharmacist or the physician. The American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology recommends uh, it, this vaccine be offered to pregnancy, it, uh, people who are pregnant and to uh, women breastfeeding. And it's also okay to get this vaccine if you had the disease in the past. And the reason is um, there's a rare chance of getting reinfected 90 days after you got the infection, number one. Number two, the um, natural immunity is variable while the vaccine immunity is specifically designed to make neutralizing antibodies that uh, neutralize the virus and are targeting the spike protein. The other question commonly asked about is, do these messenger RNA vaccines affect our genetic material, the DNA? The answer is no, because at no point does the RNA ever come into contact with our DNA, number one. Number two, it also disintegrates after it's uh, translated. And um, so it, uh, after a couple of days, this actually the vaccine disappears. Um, so that's the good news. About other vaccines, if you're taking flu vaccine or any other vaccine like shingles vaccine, uh, any vaccine, you want to wait 14 days between this vaccine and the other vaccines. And then if you have had the disease COVID-19 and you received convalescent plasma treatment or the IV infusion with antibodies, the monoclonal antibodies from Regeneron and Eli Lilly, um, those kind of products, then you need to wait 90 days um, before you can get this vaccine. So both Pfizer and Moderna vaccine do not contain any fetal cell lines. So no fetal cell lines or fetal cells were used in either development or production. So when you get this injection, you can be assured that um, this was uh, made in an ethical manner. I know this is a very sensitive topic, uh, the ethics behind using fetal cells. The good news is both vaccines uh, are synthesized not in cells, it's synthesized in the lab. So um, very safe, very ethically um, um, good vaccines. Uh, so no concerns there if that's one of your concerns. And vaccines do not cause Bell's palsy and there's no link to these either. There were five cases of Bell's palsy in the trials, but none of them were linked. These were studied independently. Um, that just happened to occur in the population at the time of the study. And then allergies to polyethylene glycol or PEG. And PEG is found in laxatives that we physicians prescribe to you when you undergo a colonoscopy because before you go for colonoscopy, this laxative is given to prepare the bowel so it's clean and easy to visualize. So unless you've been told you're allergic to it or you would know this because it'd be on your record and you would also be told this, um, you're safe to get this vaccine. That's the only thing that's uh, there in this vaccine in that fat droplet that uh, en envelops the uh, RNA. And then no testing needed before you get this vaccine. No need to test to see if you had antibodies, no need to test to see if you're positive. None of that matters because if you're um, you know, going to get this vaccine, it is beneficial regardless of whether you had infection before or not. So question comes up quite often is um, people have rheumatologic conditions or they're immunocompromised. So there are people with rheumatoid arthritis sometimes are put on immunologicals and then those that are immunocompromised that folks are receiving uh, act under cancer, active cancer, receiving chemotherapy or radiation, those folks are immunocompromised. And can they get this vaccine? The answer is yes. So what you have to remember is during the trial, they, they cannot enroll these folks because obviously they're at high risk um, so they're not enrolled, um, but we know from uh, other vaccines, the only way the uh, autoimmune conditions and folks with immunocompromise is w during the vaccination after the trials are concluded, it's safe for regular folks. And that's the only way we can uh, do that. So uh, honestly, the best way is to have a shared decision-making conversation with your physician um, who's treating you for your immunocompromised condition. But the answer is still yes. People with autoimmune inflammatory diseases, 
uh, on immunosuppressive therapies, uh, all these folks, they can receive it and they'll continue to be evaluated. And that's how we get typically our um, answer. That's the phase four trials, post-marketing surveillance, um, where any of, if any of these folks develop uh, unusual conditions, we would know. But the vast majority of the time in previous vaccines, the same has occurred. No vaccine can be tested on this small group of people. Um, what happens is, if it is safe in regular folks, a uh, vast majority of the time it's safe in these folks as well. So the answer is you can get it, but just make sure you have that conversation with your physician. And as far as allergies, um, the one allergy that we're always concerned about is anaphylaxis, which is a systemic um, in, uh, you know, allergic reaction of the entire body. People usually stop breathing or have hard time breathing. Their blood pressure drops, they don't, they don't have good circulation, they get dizzy, faint, and all that. And those folks, are it, it's a precaution, and we usually keep everyone who gets the vaccine for at least 15 minutes. Uh, vast majority of the time in those 15 minutes, uh, any side effects are immediately apparent. If you have mild reactions, not a problem, no precautions in, in either other than what we do, we observe you. And if you're having reactions to food, to pets, to venom, to environmental, environmental agents, or latex, or oral medications of any kind, there's no reason to worry. Um, we will observe you here, so no worry at all. You should get the vaccine. And we'll talk briefly about anaphylaxis, all the reported anaphylaxis by the CDC. So um, roughly to give you an idea, 5% of the United States population has had such a reaction to various substances, not necessarily vaccines. And allergies to insect stings, food, these can provoke it, but drugs are the most common cause in the US. So, 45 million doses have been given so far of both these vaccines uh, in the United States, UK, and 50 other countries, so worldwide, and no deaths reported due to the vaccine. And, and here's the better uh, part about it. Uh, they had a report in uh, the CDC's publication on January 6th. There were a total of 21 cases of anaphylaxis associated with the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. And then you can see, uh, so that roughly amounts to 11 cases per million doses. Um, that's, and 71% of these occurred within 15 minutes of vaccination. They're still um, waiting for a publication that'll come out this week on um, the same thing for the Moderna vaccine. Uh, that data is not out yet. And of these people, of the 21, 17 had a previous history of allergies and seven had a history of anaphylaxis. The good news is they all recovered, no deaths. So again, the correct precautions can be observed for you when you come to get this vaccine. Um, so not a reason to not get this because you wanna protect yourself. The benefits of protecting yourself against COVID-19 are there. Additionally, we haven't yet seen any deaths, um, thankfully. Adverse reactions, um, a good way to look at this is here are four um, different, um, you know, three vaccines and a saline injection. The first one on the left column is Shingrix, the shingles vaccine. Next is Pfizer-BioNTech COVID vaccine. Then there's Flucelvax, which is flu vaccine. And finally, placebo or saline injections. And you can see they all cause similar things, local pain, redness, swelling at the site of the injection. Then you have muscle aches, fatigue, headache, chills, fever, and gastrointestinal symptoms like nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. These are all what you would expect, but importantly, you can see um, it's very favorable for all of these, including the COVID vaccine. None of these are um, extraordinary. Even folks getting a saline injection report some of these. So in the end, as distressing and uncomfortable and pleasant, unpleasant as these are, the benefits of this vaccine far outweigh these um, day or two of these symptoms, which always resolve spontaneously, don't require any medical intervention. So the bottom line is uh, do get the uh, vaccine. Um, uh, these are not reasons to not get the vaccine. Let's take a quick look at incidental illnesses. So every single day, people die unexpectedly, and you saw in this group too, they had a few deaths, um, six in the Pfizer-BioNTech and 13 in the uh, Moderna trial, but half of them occurred actually in the placebo group as well. You have to realize strokes, heart attacks, seizures, these occur all the time. Um, to give you an example, Bell's palsy, which is a temporary paralysis of the face, goes away, it's temporary. I know there's a lot of people who are distressed by that, but the good news is it goes away on its own. And daily, uh, on an average, in the United States, our population is 328 million, and about 110 people may develop Bell's palsy daily. And the same with Guillain-Barre syndrome, another uh, dreaded complication, which is, again, a form of paralysis that resolves over time. About 274 occur daily in the US. So 
The triggers for these are not known, but the takeaway I want you to remember is these are what are called incidental illnesses. They occur um, in the rates, we call it the background rate of occurrence of strokes, seizures, heart attacks. Not a reason not to get these vaccines. In fact, vaccines have not been shown to cause these incidental illnesses. A quick look at mutation and variants in this virus. So the ancestral strain of SARS-CoV-2 in Wuhan, China, when it first started in late December of uh, 2019 and then through 2020 and then spread all across Europe and the United States. And you can see on the picture on the right is an electron microscope uh, picture of the spike protein. And then on the bottom right, you see a silhouette of a human figure. And then you can see all the different species that humans have transmitted this COVID-19 disease from humans to dogs or canines, humans to felines, including domestic cat and the lion. And then you see two mustelids, which are the minks and the ferrets, and then transmission from humans to rodents, mouse and hamsters. Now, during this, it occurred from humans to these animals and back again to humans. And then those yellow spots on that spike protein are where those changes occurred, the mutations occurred due to species transmission. And then you can see the red spots are United Kingdom human to human changes when the when the virus moves from human to human, those mutations occurred. And the, the blue spots are those that occurred in South Africa. And then the perp magenta spots are common to both the South African and the United Kingdom variant. Um, and then, the, like I said, the yellow spots are the uh, human to animal and back to animal, uh, back from animal to human transmissions. The good news is, even though there are several areas in the spike protein that were affected in all of these uh, mutations or variants, um, these variant viruses cannot escape the vaccine. The reason is simple. The vaccine designed against the spike protein is polyclonal. A simple way of saying it is it can attach to multiple sites. It is so carefully designed to provoke this antibodies from us. Our antibodies that the vaccine creates attacks all parts of the spike protein, not just one. And so unless the, vac the virus variant has multiple areas, which it doesn't, it only has one or two, uh, it doesn't escape. And they have actually done trials in the University of Texas uh, Galveston medical branch that showed that people who got this vaccine, their antibodies could neutralize these variant mutant viruses. So that's the good news. And additionally, this vaccine also creates T cell responses, a specific kind of other response from our body besides antibodies that also attack the virus and neutralize them. So in a, in a long and short, the simple takeaway is these vaccines are effective against these variant viruses. Let's look at the um, yeah, United States, 11 million vaccinated. And you can see South Dakota is doing a great job, about 6% vaccinated, say with North Dakota and a few other states. Um, but uh, kudos to the state of South Dakota getting these vaccines out to the people. And if you look at it, uh, if you rank states, um, all 50 states, uh, South Dakota is third, 61% of doses used. Um, and that's very, very um, great accomplishment. Additionally, uh, you know, 5.4% of the population have received it. So 57,000 shots given. Uh, two shots were given to 1.1%. Again, very impressive numbers there. That's at the top of the list there. And I would say at Monument Health, we've been uh, fulfilling that mission of making a difference every day in the lives of our community um, by making sure we get that out. In fact, as it stands today, and Scott will um, also mention this in his presentation, we're at 100% and a little bit more because we had some excess doses that we also gave. But the point is we uh, try to get those vaccines and immediately pass them on to where they belong in the arms of our community. So uh, it's a tremendous job, lots of people involved. Kudos to all of that and our teams for doing such a great job. And one final look at uh, completion percentages. You can see there, um, if you look at just how quickly South Dakota 1.1% uh, that have completed their full two doses and compare that to the U.S., only half percent of the United States. The only states better than us are Alaska and West Virginia and, of course, the District of Columbia. As I go through my presentation today, I'm going to talk about how we are going to get vaccine out um, to our caregivers and, and our community, which is so very important. Um, the South Dakota Department of, uh, of Health um, is um, leading 
um, the distribution of vaccine inside of the state of South Dakota. Um, Avera, Sanford, and Monument Health were recruited by the Department of Health to provide COVID vaccination services across the state. And so these three large health systems are coordinating these activities throughout phase one and then in all likelihood phase two as well. It's important to remember that the state is ultimately in control of that vaccine distribution. Uh, the vaccine goes into the state and then the state allocates that vaccine out and gives uh, guidance and directives on who to vaccinate and which group to vaccinate next. Monument Health is effectively the steward of vaccine in Western South Dakota. And so we aim to follow um, all of what the, the Department of Health directs us to do. The Department of Health is following the recommendations of, of ASIP and the CDC um, and uh, which groups to vaccinate. The following is a, a SNP from the South Dakota Department of Health website. This is very easy to find and it lists the priority groups for phase one of the vaccination and that goes phases 1A all the way through 1E. Um, phase 1A is frontline healthcare workers and long-term care facility healthcare workers. For the most part, this group has been vaccinated, uh, has been given the opportunity to be vaccinated inside of the state of South Dakota. Many of these people have already received their second dose of vaccine. Group 1B are long-term care residents. These are people that live in a nursing home or in an assisted living facility. Uh, CVS and Walgreens were contracted with the federal government to provide vaccine to this particular group and for the most part in the state of South Dakota this has been completed. I would estimate that at least 90% of first doses have been given in the state of South Dakota to nursing home and assisted living residents. This is the middle part of the infographic from the state <clears throat> and this is where uh, things have changed as of last week. Um, we are currently in uh, phase 1C and moving into 1D today. Um, and so uh, phase 1C are other healthcare workers that weren't included in 1A, also public health workers, EMS workers, law enforcement, and correctional officers. Uh, we in all of South Dakota have been in phase 1C for a number of weeks and, the, and believe that we are getting towards the end of that group. And so now there is an overlap into phase 1D and that began today on Monday, January the 18th. So the subgroups of 1D that are included starting today are people ages 80 years of age and older, also, high-risk patients that are on dialysis uh, have had a transplant in the past or are, or are under active cancer treatment. The final subgroup of 1D that we can vaccinate right now are high-risk residents in congregate settings, residents in licensed independent living facilities, and residents of licensed group homes. The rest of phase 1D are persons with two or more underlying conditions, teachers and funeral service workers, and then also those people age 65 years of age on up to age 80. And so those groups will be added later on to phase 1D. Inside of the state of South Dakota, there are about 265,000 people that fit into the category of 1D. And as the state is currently receiving about 11 or 12,000 doses per week, um, we as a state cannot open up to that entire group. And that, and that is the reason why a subgroup was chosen. After 1D, uh, the next group will be 1E, and this includes fire service personnel, other critical infrastructure workers, which is included here on the slide in a number of different areas. The state of South Dakota estimates that there are 225,000 people that are in this group 1E, which 
it's important to understand how many people are in each of these groups. It is going to take a while at the current allocation of vaccine doses to get through these groups. And so we ask that everyone be uh, patient with us, patient with the health department, patient with the state as we, uh, as we uh, subclassify off these groups and vaccinate everyone that we possibly can. This is also an infographic from the State uh, Department of Health, and it includes expected vaccine availability in the state of South Dakota. Um, it essentially goes over a number of the things that I have gone over previously on the other slides, and it lists these off in the months of January, February, March, April, and then May and on. So here in, uh, here in uh, January, we're starting off on some of phase 1D, and then the health department expects us to be in 1D for all of February and March, and then move into 1E in April, and then into phase two in May. This is a slide of the current state through last Friday as far as the number of doses that have been received by Monument Health and then the number that's been administered. So we at Monument Health, as of last Friday, had received 8,150 doses. Out of those, 1,010 doses had been sent to healthcare facilities outside of Monument Health. Those include facilities in uh, Hot Springs, and in Phillip, and in Martin, and a few other places. Um, of the vaccines that stayed inside of Monument Health for distribution, 7,113 of those doses had been administered, which means that 102% of the vaccines that were allotted for Monument Health to distribute um, uh, had been given at that time. And that's due to extra doses in some of these vials. In some cases, we're able to get a sixth dose rather than just a fifth, uh, in addition to the fifth dose out of a vial. Um, Different people that have been vaccinated is 6,239, as about 1,100 people have received second doses of vaccine. Monument Health is employing a parallel approach to Monument Health workers and non-Monument Health uh, recipients. And so we're going in both directions there and uh, being very fair in how we're, uh, we're getting vaccine out to our communities. We're vaccinating in locations in Rapid City, Spearfish, Sturgis, Deadwood, Custer, Phillip, Hot Springs, and Martin. So in summary, this process is going to take us several months to complete. Also, everyone will have an opportunity to be vaccinated in, in this process. So if you are eligible, um, if you're over the age of 16, you will have the opportunity to be vaccinated. Numerous variables are at play in this process. Uh, two examples are supply and the uptake of vaccine. The state will continue to guide this process all the way throughout as the state receives vaccine and tells us and uh, lets us know which groups to include next. And then as a final note, please be patient as we walk through these steps to complete all of the priorities. So with that, I will complete for today. Thank you very much.